Thank you, Carol, for this introduction, especially about this uh, new initiative of the Commission to conduct a study on new psychoactive substances. So, uh, my organization, the ACIU, uh, has an international network, an international program on drug policy. We call it the European Drug Policy Initiative. And we work with NGOs in uh, five other countries. Uh, one in Romania, there is a representative from Romania here. And uh, we have one NGO from Bulgaria, from Portugal, Abdesh, and uh, Serbia, and Poland. And uh, our aim is to make coordinated advocacy actions for evidence-based, public health-based drug policies. Uh, and we produce documentaries and films about drug policy in various countries. So if you go to our website, it's drugreporter.net, then uh, you, you can find like, um, each can tell uh, how many, but it's like hundreds of short mm -hmm. advocacy movies online, available online. And uh, these movies are now also used in universities for teaching uh, students about drug policy. So our topic is today new psychoactive substances, and in the media there are a lot of uh, terms like legal high and designer drug, but the official definition of the EU, or European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction is this. A new narcotic or psychotropic drug in pure form of preparation that is not controlled by the UN drug conventions, but which may pose a public health threat comparable to that posed by substances listed in these conventions. So these conventions, we, ha we have three uh, United Nations conventions on drugs. First is the 61, second is 71 convention and the third is the 88 convention against illicit traffic in narcotic drugs. So these uh, these conventions uh, define the lists of illicit substances. And uh, now we are talking about those substances which don't belong to this list. So they are designed after, uh, after this adoption of these conventions. So they are not controlled, but their effects are very similar to the effects of illegal drugs. So this is the purpose. They are designed to avoid criminal sanctions. And um, uh, why we are talking about this now, as Carol mentioned, there is a big boom of uh, these sub substances uh, right now. In uh, 2009, there were 40, uh, 24 new substances uh, registered in the EU. Then in uh, 2010, it was 41. Then in uh, 2011, 49. And last year, it was 73 new substances registered. So you can see that there is a gradual increase of the number of, of new substances. And this is the number of uh, online shops selling legal highs in the EU. So you can see that it's, there is a really rapid increase of, of online shops uh, in the EU. Um, why, why it happened now? There are different theories uh, about this. Uh, one theory is that in 2008, 2009, there was a huge decline in the purity of illegal drugs. Uh, for example, MDMA, which is the uh, s major substance in ecstasy pills. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, 2008, for example, there were huge uh, seizures, police seizures in e Southeast Asia, where they seized tons of, uh, of the uh, precursor substance which MDMA is made from. And uh, in Europe, there were a lot of crackdowns, police crackdowns against the illicit laboratories. So. Uh, probably this also boosted the uh, 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 designing of new substances. Uh, this is a, a graph from my country, Hungary. Uh, in uh, before 2008, 94% uh, <coughs> of ecstasy pills contained MDMA as the major uh, pure substance. After uh, just uh, last year, this is uh, from last year, you see that only 4% of ecstasy pills seized contained MDMA. So this shows that uh, now there are quite a rich diversity of uh, psychoactive substances in ecstasy pills. So uh, actually now we have a completely different situation than uh, five or, or six years ago. Uh, there is another explanation why these substances are flourishing. And this is the globalization of uh, drug trafficking and it becoming online. So there are now online financial transactions. It's very hard to follow them. Uh, in pharmaceutical companies in China or India, they, s they are selling these substances uh, to Europe and uh, North America. So 
the BBC made a documentary a few years ago that a reporter is going to China to the pharmaceutical company and he's asking for a substance and uh, the Chinese company says that yes of course how much you need and he's asking like oh but maybe this will be banned in two months okay no problem we already designed the next one which won't be banned so it's like very easy <coughs> and um, and of course, online shops make make the uh, purchase very easy, very anonymous. So uh, you know, it's much better for the users to order it than go to the street dealer. And uh, of course, an expl another explanation is that they use online marketing strategies targeting young people. This is an example. So, like you know, uh, they are they are targeting the dance scene, the club club uh, goer, young people. And they are selling these drugs as uh, as euphoric, and they you know enhance your party experience. Um, oh no, this and uh, we we uh, this year we made a study in uh, five uh, European countries on uh, uh, new psychoactive substances in Portugal, Poland, Hungary, Romania, and Serbia. Uh, the aim is to assess how professionals and affected communities perceive. Uh, or how, how they see the trends in, in the use of these drugs, how they see the uh, impact of policies, and also what are the recommendations for policymakers about these new psychoactive substances. And we asked our NGO partners to identify 10 or 20 key people from each country, like professionals from different fields, policemen, doctors, psychiatrists, social workers, uh, and drug users. And we prepared a questionnaire, so we made uh, more than 100 interviews with in, 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 in each country. And, uh, uh, and now we are analyzing the results of this uh, uh, questionnaire. So we asked what are the major substances we are talking about. And there are two major groups of these substances. One is the stimulant group, so, you know, uh, amphetamine type stimulants and catenones. Catenone is a synthetic version, actually, of the substance in cut uh, leaf, which is like consumed in uh, Ethiopia and Yemen. Uh, and uh, these drugs are stimulants, usually snorted or injected. And then there are the synthetic cannabinoids, you know, which are like replacing uh, marijuana, uh, but they have uh, uh, they have a synthetic uh, ingredients. Uh, there are many many kinds of these ingredients, and they are selling it as herbal or botanic. Uh, things, but actually they are synthetic, so they have nothing to do with herbs, but j they just uh, put them on herbs. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> we also asked our uh, stakeholders why people use these substances, what are the motivation for young people to use this. So the major answer was that it's cheap and it's easily available. Then the legal status, that people don't, they are not afraid of criminalization because uh, these drugs are legal. Then, as I mentioned, these smart marketing strategies uh, also help the boost of these uh, substances. Then it's interesting that the effect or impact of media, you know, that media, you know, usually they make a big uh, hysteria or media hype about these substances. And usually it's ma very much against drugs or they are depicting the negative effects, but for many young people, it's, it serves as an advertisement. So they are, you know, watching television, and oh, this, this, uh, maybe I should uh, try that. So that they have a boomerang effect of this media campaign, or media uh, hysteria. And then there are some users who say that the effects of these drugs are more intensive. There is a kind of drug user folklore. They s a lot of people think that they are not, uh, they don't co cause dependence. These drugs, so you can, you know, uh, use them without being addicted. And then uh, there is a miss. Uh, there, is, there is also a reason for methadone clients who get uh, uh, methadone instead of heroin in hospitals. And these drugs are not detectable by drug tests, so then they can avoid drug testing uh, from the blood and from the urine. Um, we we identified two major patterns of of drug u of the use of these substances, and one pattern is the recreational or club drug user. So these are young people, usually late teens or early 20s, who go to party and they use these uh, substances as uh, for, for dancing and you know to be awake and, uh, and feeling good at parties. And the major root of, uh, of uh, consu consumption is snorting of these drugs. Of course, with synthetic cannabinoids, it's smoking. They are smoking it from cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
there are, what we also asked what are the risks of this kind of uh, use. And uh, in hospitals, there are many like psychotic episode cases when people just got paranoid or aggressive because of this, if they overuse these substances. And then, you know, another risk is unprotected sex. So they, uh, a lot of young people just uh, have sex after using the substances and they don't uh, use any condoms. And uh, also, when some people don't know, but through the snorting, uh, you can get uh, hepatitis C mm -hmm. because uh, through the blood, if you share this uh, snorting equipment, you can get uh, hepatitis C infection. Uh, and in uh, actually in two countries, in Portugal and Serbia, this was the like the major or main main uh, pattern of drug use. But in some countries, as Carol also mentioned, uh, there is another pattern of drug use. This is like the dependent users who are using the substance daily, every day. And uh, usually these people are dif belong to a different kind of social group. So they belong to an unemployed, uneducated, low-class, marginalized uh, groups. In Hungary and Romania, many of them are Roma people, so they belong to the Roma minority. Uh, many of them are experienced heroin or amphetamine users. So they switch from heroin or amphetamine to these new substances, and they inject it. They inject the uh, they inject these substances, and uh, um, and actually, uh, what we can witness in Hungary and in Romania is that uh, after heroin users switch to use these new stimulants, they are they have uh, they they don't sleep, they don't eat, they are like losing uh, 15 kilograms in a few weeks and uh, uh, and they have like uh, psychosis and uh, paranoia and there are many emergency cases in hospitals so you know some of our interviewees toxicologists for example they said that oh I have a nostalgia for the o good old drugs like heroin because we don't didn't have so much so many problems with them but now we are just really overwhelmed with, with this uh, new substances and in Romania, Poland, and Hungary, this is a very significant problem in the eastern part of Europe. Uh, and uh, this is also made even more severe, this problem, because of the financial crisis. We should talk about this, I think. That, uh, and, and especially in regard to the injecting use. Because uh, uh, with heroin, heroin users inject four times a day or five times a day. But these uh, substances are injected like 10 or 15 times a day <coughs> because their effects are only very short. So they are re-injecting it many times a day. So this means that they are using more syringes, you know, and they're sharing it more with each, with, 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 with among each other. And uh, this means that there is a bigger risk of uh, infections. If you share needles, if you share uh, syringes, you can get HIV, you can get uh, hepatitis C. And, um, and actually, <laughs> this, this just coincided with financial austerity in countries. For example, in Hungary, there was a very dramatic reduction of uh, the support for, for harm reduction programs like needle exchange, where they are giving out uh, sterile needles for drug users. And, uh, and uh, there was less available sterile needles, so this means that more risk of infections. And uh, in some countries like Romania, now we, have, we, we witness a major uh, outbreak of HIV epidemic among uh, drug users. So it's like, Valentin will talk about it, it's like 30% of injecting drug users have HIV now. And you know, to, uh, to treat HIV, that costs much, much more than preventing HIV. Um, so this is, this is a graph showing that uh, in Romania and in Greece, in the European Union now, there is a major uh, epidemic, HIV epidemic. Before we, are, we were always talking about HIV in Russia or Ukraine outside of the EU. Well, now this is a very serious European problem and I think we should uh, deal with it in the European level. Uh, so the question arises why, why there are so different uh, trends in Western Europe or Eastern Europe. Why is it that in uh, Portugal we don't have uh, injecting use of these substances? There are some explanations for this. like. There is a different uh, availability of illegal drugs in these countries, like in uh, uh, in, in Portugal, or in, uh, there there were like better quality illegal substances, and maybe they are more available. And uh, there is also an explanation that there is a difference between the drug policies in these countries. So in Portugal, for example, we have drug use is decriminal 
decriminalized, so users don't face uh, punishment. So it's a big, bigger motivation in Hungary or in Romania for drug users to avoid uh, the police than in Portugal. And then there is also a question how, how much drug users access to treatment. In Portugal there is a bigger access than in Romania or in Hungary. And then the st social status of drug users is different, as I said. In, in uh, Romania and Hungary, we have a huge group of uh, Roma marginalized drug users who are living in uh, very concentrated uh, parts of the cities. So this, uh, Carol was always mentioned uh, how the Euro European Union is reacting to this uh, problem, and this, there is this uh, three steps approach of, of for new psychoactive substances. First step is identifying the substances. This is early warning. There are early warning systems in, in, in all countries. Uh, these are, you know, to detect these new, new substances. Then the next phase is risk assessment. Usually it's made by the European uh, Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drug uh, Addiction. So they are assessing the risks of uh, new substances. They, they produce a risk assessment report. And then uh, uh, by the initiative of the European Commission or the member states can initiate control uh, measures so they can decide how to co how they will control these uh, uh, new substances and what are the control measures it's uh, usually they are adding uh, this new cycle of substances to lists of illicit substances or they are creating new lists for these drugs they try to disrupt uh, the trafficking uh, chains and they are banning the shops of, of uh, they are selling these substances and then uh, they introduce new penalties for, for traffickers or users of these uh, drugs. So the aim is to reduce the supply of, of these drugs for these uh, uh, measures. And uh, this is how our stakeholders perceive this, uh, this uh, fight against illicit drugs. It's like a car race, you know, when the lawmakers are always a few steps behind of the drug designers. Because as I mentioned before, the drug designers are already thinking ahead. So they are, you know, designing new drugs which, were, which will avoid the, the, the schedules of, of the uh, uh, banned substances. So our, the, the stakeholders we asked, they said that, uh, that it's, it's necessary to regulate the substances. So it's not, it's not acceptable that these substances are sold by online shops. So we have to do something about it. But they are still very skeptical about the effectiveness of this uh, procedure. It's like the Sisyphus fight, you know, that you are never, it's like a never ending fight. And some, some, ca some countries uh, try to, you know, break this devil circle somehow. Uh, in Poland, for example, the chief sanitary inspectorate uh, closed down this shop saying that these substances usually are sold as uh, uh, bath salts or they are sold as uh, plant, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, like you know, plant fertilizers, <laughs> so they are, then the chief sanitary inspectorate is coming. No, this is not plant fertilizer, so I closed the shop. So it's like kind of consumer protection, uh, but and they also amended their drug law, and they introduced a new term, substitute drug. So this means that all those drugs who are subs that are substitutes for illegal dr illegal drugs can be banned. And then in Romania, there was a law uh, that requires shop owners to prove that the substance they, do, they sell is not psychoactive. So they, they can ban all the shops that, don't, uh, uh, that can, they cannot prove that their substances are psychoactive. Then in, in uh, Hungary, my country, in 2012, they introduced a generic list. What does it mean, generic list? It means that now they don't ban substances individually, like one by one, but they ban a whole group of substances. Uh, so they try to prevent, you know, designers that they can modify the molecule structure and then it's legal. And uh, right now in Portugal, uh, they introduced a temporary list of uh, many new psychoactive substances and they banned the commercial activities uh, with these substances. So our stakeholders said that these are very necessary steps. However, they have many concerns about uh, the impact of this kind of legislation. And, uh, and uh, one of the concerns mentioned by our stakeholders is policies uh, rarely uh, driven by evidence. It's, uh, 
many times politicians or the decision makers react to the media hype of, of, of a substance and they you know when something a death case happens and it is in, in, in the media then there is a political reaction but when the experts or professionals are asking to do something then it's nothing happening so it's like the politics uh, is uh, is many times driven by by media and not by by the evidence uh, then there is another concern that uh, actually uh, after banning these substances you don't solve the problem you just replace the problem that uh, there is a black market so these substances are still sold in the black market and uh, in Hungary or in Romania after uh, banning of the shops there is still a uh, black market of these uh, substances. So we cannot say that only by banning the shops you solve the problem because we still have the problem. Uh, then there is a, an issue of the transparency of the market. Like usually people in the illicit or, or gray market, they don't know what they use. And uh, uh, if the more you, uh, you are pushing these substances underground, uh, the less knowledge is uh, available about these uh, substances, and many of the experts say that the m the, the the main uh, danger of these substances is that we don't know anything about them. There is no research. There is nothing about like they don't know what are the long term effects. They can you know uh, you know affect the brain or or how they are uh, what what are their effects in the longer term. Uh, and uh, there are some people who say that. Uh, uh, we need a different approach, like we need to uh, uh, regulate somehow this market and uh, we need some kind of consumer protection uh, system. Uh, and stakeholders also have a concern about the criminalization of drug users. They say that the criminalization of drug users is counter counterproductive, so it's like having a boomerang effect. It does not reduce uh, drug demand, but uh, actually uh, uh, it just ma makes, for example, services less available for drug users, so they are like, uh, they cannot access uh, treatment services. For example, in my country, Hungary, they just introducing, uh, from the 1st of July, they are restricting the penalties against drug users. So uh, this is uh, contrary to the, what the experts say. And then there are some issues with constitutional rights. For example, some people say, said that by banning groups of substances, then you are banning uh, those drugs which have never been invented before. So they, we don't know anything about these uh, uh, drugs, and they may have some medical value or, or any, anything, you know, they can be used for other purposes, and if we are banning them without any risk assessment, we just, you know, we just don't know uh, uh, this. And uh, in Poland or in Romania, there are also concerns that uh, you know, it's very arbitrary how the police is using or the authorities are using this law. Like, you have to prove you don't sell psychoactive substances, but then, you know, uh, it's, it's just the authority who says which shop should, uh, should be inspected. And then we have a lot of psychoactive substances like coffee or alcohol, and then that's, that's also psychoactive. So it's like a bit... Uh, and then the, there is an issue about evaluation and monitoring that in most of these countries there is no evaluation of what are the impacts of, of legislation. So they are suggesting also that we have to, if we have a policy, then we have to evalu monitor and evaluate the results. And uh, this means that we need to know what are the impacts of the, these legislations on the market, on the price, availability, and many times we, don't, uh, we just you know, uh, ban a substance, but then we don't follow up. Uh, uh, what's happening. And then this was a very important uh, concern about policies that, uh, you know, the EU is claiming to have a balanced approach. That means that we are, uh, we have an approach that uh, we, we have uh, public health, social approach and also criminal policies. But uh, in many countries there are no uh, public health or social responses, like the treatment system is not uh, improved. The, there is no money for, for prevention, for example. So it's like uh, uh, we just ban substances, but we don't spend money on prevention, treatment, and, uh, and harm reduction. And uh, the treatment system in these countries is very unprepared to, for the substances. I mentioned before that some doctors said that, oh, it was much better before when we had these heroin users, you know, 
they were just uh, stoned. In, they were stoned sitting in the treatment center. They were not aggressive. They were, but with these substances, they are paranoid, uh, aggressive, and uh, we don't know what to do with them because with heroin users, there are medical treatments like methadone, but with these substances, they just don't know what to do with these people, and uh, they don't know about the effects of the substances. So it's like very, very hard. So. This is uh, one of the, I think, very important um, lesson learned from this study that we need to invest into the treatment system to train professionals how to deal with these uh, new substances. Also to, you know, uh, uh, find new treatment methods which are adjusted to these uh, stimulants drugs. Uh, and also it should be made available for these uh, treatment sites that they have to test substances what their clients use so they, they know that what's, what are these uh, drugs. So there are treatment guidelines li missing and trainings uh, missing from, from the system. And then there are, there are some media campaigns and uh, most of our professionals said that they are not very effective, that you know they try to scare young people that you should not use this drug because then this and this happens. And actually, we have now quite a few uh, good uh, research about this kind of media campaigns. And they say that this kind of mass media campaigns are not very effective. In, uh, in Poland, for example, there was a big campaign. Uh, this uh, poster says that uh, legal highs will burn your brain. And uh, this is like a scare campaign. You know, they want to uh, scare people from these drugs. Or this is from Romania. Uh, and this poster says that uh, even the cows are smarter than designer drug users because they know what uh, grass to eat. And these <coughs> designer drug users, they don't know what, what to eat. So it's like, uh, again, stigmatizing. And, uh, you know, uh, UNODC, the UN Drug Agency, just released a report of, about drug prevention. And they, the, one of the major conclusions is that this kind of uh, prevention campaigns are not effective. Still, you know, from political perspective, sometimes <coughs> it's very good because you can show it to the window, like, yeah, we spent to this campaign. So, uh, so there is a gap between evidence and politics again here. So, and then, what are the recommendations of uh, of uh, of our uh, stakeholders? It's like reallocating resources to education and public health. We need to spend money on research of these substances. Uh, we need to decriminalize uh, drug use. Uh, and there were, there were some professionals who said that uh, we need even uh, more strict drug laws. But this was a minority, and other people said that we need to invent something like a new approach for, for, for uh, these drugs. And actually, there are no, no like, uh, uh, there are like no uh, ultimate solutions for this problem. There are countries that are now experimenting with different uh, policies. As I told you, a lot of European countries are experimenting with different approaches. Now it's like uh, there is one country, New Zealand, which has an interesting approach uh, that they are, they are requiring the producers of these substances to prove that uh, they are low uh, risk substances. So it's like putting the burden of proof to the producers and not to the, the, to the government. It's just uh, being as accepted now in New Zealand, so we will see, I don't know how it will work. Uh, but it's, uh, it's an interesting question. And uh, of course, I think these substances also uh, push us to rethink uh, uh, our approach to drugs in general. Like we should, we should uh, think about how effective our drug policies are, what can we do, uh, what can, how can we improve our efforts. And uh, now my organization is part of a campaign uh, which aims to, uh, aims to uh, urge governments to make a, an, an overview of, of the past 50 years of drug policies because the 61 convention is 50 years old. And uh, there was no evaluation whatsoever on, on like wha how how it works in practice. So we are we are asking uh, member states of the UN to make a, a transparent review of, of UN drug policies. We have a website uh, countthecosts.org. So that means that we should count the costs of drugs and drug policies after 50 years. And uh, in uh, 
in uh, 2016 there will be a general assembly of the UN on drugs which will discuss drugs so it's the last uh, general assembly was in 1998 on drugs that that year the slogan was a drug free world we can do it and the aim was to make a world free of drugs in 10 years but of course now we see that uh, it didn't work very well this idea so probably uh, this time we need a more realistic uh, approach not like uh, so utopia, utopia approach but something which is which has uh, more to do with the reality uh, what I think is that uh, uh, drugs are here to say so we won't have a drug free society I mean that's a utopia it's a nice utopia maybe but it will never happen so we need to find policies that are like more uh, based on evidence and based on human rights and, and public health um, this, uh, this was the poster of the uh, 1998 U UN gas and now actually the EU will be also engaged in this procedure of the UN gas the European uh, Commission is all coordinating this uh, and, and I think the EU should find a united voice to speak about these issues uh, I think now we have a very interesting time and uh, uh, as far as I know this EU Commission study will be discussed at the European Parliament too so uh, uh, we hope that this kind of studies also can contribute to the discussion and uh, and then I hope that the EU will find a consensus uh, and uh, and this is this this will be a good one uh, I am the member of the civil society forum on drugs this is a this is an expert group of the European Commission uh, it uh, it is it consists of uh, 40 NGOs from Europe and uh, and actually it serves as a platform of the uh, uh, dialogue between the Commission and civil society and uh, uh, it was established a few years ago so it's quite new it's a fresh experiment I think it's a very good channel for the civil society to channel its uh, voice to the decision makers in the EU and I hope that uh, we will also establish some kind of relations to the European Parliament because I think it's also important that the European Parliament is speaking to the civil society about drugs uh, so uh, actually this is just happening now uh, yesterday we had a meeting here in Brussels with the members of government they they have a horizontal working group on drugs they are sending representatives and we had a joint meeting first joint meeting of civil society and governments and uh, I hope we can have similar meetings at the European Parliament too. Okay, thank you very much. And um, this is our website, so you can find many information about this. We will publish the report soon. So if you, uh, we will, George will collect your emails, and then I can send you the report to to all, all of you.